Hello and a warm welcome to Personal Finance. I'm Kukule Tutele. So you finally found the one and you're thinking of taking your relationship to the next level. But where does this leave you and your finances? And have you had that all difficult conversation regarding debt and how to split things between yourself and your partner? Well, tonight we're going to take a look at money management tools for couples. And to add some perspective to this, I'm joined in studio by Michelle Dubois, who's a legal marketing specialist at Liberty. Adam Halper, he's a certified financial planner with Discovery, Bruce Fleming, certified financial planner with Consolidated Financial Planning, who's also affiliated with the Financial Planning Institute of South Africa. And in our Lagos studio, I'm joined by the well-known friendly face of finance in Nigeria, Nimi Akingube, who is the chief executive of Best Man Games. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. I think uh, it's often been compared that your relationship with your financial fin advisor needs to be one of a, a marriage type or long-term relationship. But I take it, uh, uh, Michelle, Michelle, if we start off with you, for anyone who's in any kind of relationship, uh, one needs to look at the legal implications first of that particular union, whether you be married or cohabitating, and the various contracts that uh, are included and involved when it comes to being married. Definitely. It's very important that couples understand what is the legal relationship, what is the contract that underpins their, their relationship. So if they are married, do they know how they are married? Mm -hmm. Have they been married with an anti-nuptial contract? Because if they have been married with an anti-nuptial contract, that would mean their marriage is going to be out of community of property. And that means everything that's yours is yours and everything that's mine is mine. But they might also have included the accrual system, which mm. is an automatic inclusion, unless you, of course, deliberately exclude it. And the accrual system comes into play when the marriage comes to an end and we then need to share the spoils of that marriage. So we have a look at how much did your estate grow during the marriage and how much did my estate grow. And then we need to kind of even that out. And then, of course, you have what is becoming an increasing trend in South Africa at the moment, and that is so-called common law spouses. Mm. And the interesting thing is that our law actually doesn't have such a thing as a common law spouse. We merely have people who are cohabitating. And that can also have some really interesting legal complications. Mm. Adam, to come to you, how difficult does this make your job as an advisor when Google comes with his sweetheart and says, hey, yeah. sort out our finances? So uh, I'm very, very, uh, very quick to tell them to try and move the emotions aside. And, you know, couples are very quick to do everything together. Mm. And I'm a stern believer of keeping everything separate. Not because, we, pl you know, financial planning is often about planning for scenarios that are not necessarily, they're not something you actually expect to happen, but could happen. And I think it's very important. And if I think about the past in my career, I have seen many situations where we've had to separate joint life policies and joint investments and stuff and see what belongs to who. And it becomes very messy. And I think it's, there's no particular gain to that uh, in, in actually doing it. In fact, on the contrary, it's probably a disadvantage to do everything together. So I try and keep the emotional uh, love, uh, at all of that, <laughs> all the fairies and whatever that come around, the whole marriage thing. You know, p couples are newlywed or, or together, as um, Michelle mentions, common law is not really a real uh, thing. But the fact is, if you're going to be doing stuff together, you want to make it official. There are other ways of making it official. Mm. You don't have to go and do all your stuff together when it comes to financial planning. So maybe that joint bank account wasn't such a great idea, huh? Mm -hmm. Definitely not. That's one of my <laughs> favorite points is, is the joint bank account. And yeah. I think often women somehow think that they have this joint bank account with their, with their spouses. Mm. And there's no such thing in mm. our law as a joint bank account. So it's really just the husband's bank account, but you've got a credit card that yeah. works on his account. Sort of. And the biggest thing for me is what happens if something happens to him and he passes away? That account is going to be frozen and you're not going to have access to an account. So mm. for me, the first thing we have to keep separate is we need to each have our own bank accounts. Exactly. Bruce, I'd like to come to you in our Cape Town studio uh, to, to get your thoughts and feel with regard to this discussion. I, I take it then as a CFP as well, when you sit down and consult with uh, potential lovebirds, uh, what you're also looking to do is mitigate against any potential risk there uh, that might be presented, whether it's for life cover or the protection of various assets from an asset point of view and from a planning point of view it is important to to keep them separate however <clears throat> when we do financial planning for couples we make sure that both couples are are involved in the process from the beginning um, gone are the days I believe that one of the partners makes the decisions for the for the partners so we we make sure that both partners are are, are a fay with what's going on in their financial relationship um, but obviously we do take into account you know, the possibilities of what might happen. 
But just to go on what, from what Michelle said, I agree on the, on the, on the joint bank account side, but, but certainly the, the, the spouses need to know what's going on in each other's lives. Um, and they also need to know what, what to do should one of or other of the spouses actually pass away. They need to know who the financial planner is, why he puts some stuff together or she puts some stuff together for the, for the joint partnership. So to an extent, I agree um, to keep things separate, but you need to financially plan for a couple for the long term. Mm -hmm. um, and if that includes your life cover that, that possibly will, will come into play on the death of one of the spouses, the other spouse certainly needs to know what's going on. Exactly. Well, we've heard the South African perspective on things, but what about what's happening in Nigeria? Nimi, this is clearly where you come into the conversation to tell us what the landscape is like and uh, uh, maybe if there are uh, current trends that are unfolding in uh, the uh, financial services space uh, with regard to financial planning for couples and how women also fit in where uh, they're also changing the dynamic of being uh, uh, the head of the household in the terms of uh, contributing financially, financially to homes. Yes. Yes, no, you're finding, well, first of all, we're coming from a society that's largely patriarchal. So that's that you've, you've got that traditional situation with the gender roles, and you've had the women who have come out traditionally the, the male member of the family, either their father or their brother, has traditionally looked after them. And now with the new, the, the sort of the emergence of very successful, influential women, the, the dynamic is changing, and that is an issue that is not being addressed as much as I think it should be. So you find a lot of, of, of conflicts because of, of these money, money issues. Who owns what? What name is property in? How is, what's the sharing formula? So I agree with the last speakers about keeping things separate. But for the dynamic and some of the ego issues, you tend to feel that you have to still defer to the, to the male member of the household as the head of the household. So that still is, is a major issue. Another problem we have here is people are always busy planning the wedding and hardly ever <laughs> the marriage. So you have a lot of people coming into marriage without any planning in terms of what their risk tolerance is and what their aspirations are. People aren't sitting down together as a team to plan towards their short, medium and long term goals. And those, there are implications um, f of that as well. Mm. You are quite right there. Huh? Post the uh, wedding day bells, so then reality hits. But Bruce, I'd like to come to you and then uh, get your perspective again, Adam, uh, with regard to the purchase of assets. As we've heard, the key theme that's come out of the conversation so far is keeping your assets separate but how do you control that and manage it when you're purchasing a home together which you'll be living in together and uh, uh, vehicles and other assets that might be associated with it like investment accounts well, i think it, again it depends on on how you married so if you're married in community of property both parties are, are party to half the assets and half the liabilities i think from a from an out of community of property situation um, it all depends on who's got the better credit rating. You know, there are a number of things that you need to, to consider when looking at it. Um, but again, I'm, I'm a big believer in, in doing this as a joint, as a, as a team. Uh, husband and wife make the decisions where would the assets best fit, um, you know, in the, in the relationship from a tax planning point of view, from an estate planning point of view, etc. cetera. Um, but again, as, and I'll, I'll go back to it, I, I believe in the team approach um, where both parties make the decision together. Team approach, Adam, I'm sure you agree here. No, I do largely agree from a transparency point of view. I think it's very important to be very transparent with, with ev all those major decisions. And often a property is the biggest decision a, a, a couple will make together, mm -hmm. um, a financial decision. And it's critically important to make sure, uh, you know, as Bruce says, where, where does it fit in? Where does the asset fit in? And I think it's also, uh, y there's an old school approach of having the house in the wife's name and then husband pays or you know in case the creditors come after the husband mm. then the house is not lost but it, I don't think there is a uniform answer to that question and I, I personally do uh, like the joint bond uh, idea I think it's not a I, I don't think it's a bad idea it's certainly not a joint bank account yeah. um, and and I think it's it's great you know especially if there's it also depends on whether there's dual income because the dual income often will be considered w with that bond application. And if that's the case, the bank is going to want nine out of 10 times the house to be in both parties' names mm. or sureties. So I think it also it is very case specific with regards to the property mm -hmm. primary residence. 
uh, obviously that's something that will tie in quite importantly would be the, the important legal documentation, Michelle, again, mm. that needs to be processed in there when it comes to purchasing these assets or uh, putting together a financial plan. But how cognizant should couples also be about uh, uh, the particular changes that come about in their life? Having children or uh, parents who they might have to look after. In South Africa we have that trend of the sandwich mm. generation. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, that's yeah. obviously something that also comes into play here. Definitely. And I think this is where not only transparency, but also just a financial awareness is so important. So to, to coin the phrase um, that Bruce used, the team approach, I think we need to keep our independence as individuals, have our own bank accounts, have our own credit ratings and things like that. But there's no harm in building wealth mm. together as well. And to do that, we need to be aware of each other's financial plans. I always recommend that we put together kind of a, a book of life. And in that book of life, you would have things like copies of IDs. You would have things like copies of passports. But then you also have things like the title deed mm. for properties that you own or life insurance policies, a will, all those kinds of things. So if something were to happen to your significant other, you wouldn't be at a complete loss as to, well, I don't know who pays the rates or what my logon is to make an electronic payment and he died the day before the, the electricity gets cut off or, yeah. or something yeah. like that. You need to have an awareness of what's going on in each other's lives because mm -hmm. you are in a partnership after all. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bruce, to come to you for a moment, uh, the, the, the trend regarding the sandwich generation, which is very prevalent uh, in South Africa, has this often been a, a, a sore spot for couples that maybe you've consulted with in the past? Oh, it happens all the time, yes. I mean, it's, I'm not sure about Joburg, but Cape Town, certainly we, we are the sandwich generation where, where we, we're finding couples having to plan not only for their, for their lifestyles, but for their parents and their children. So, yeah, it's become, it, it has definitely become a bit of a problem. Um, you know, where I don't think it's a problem of the, of the previous generation. I think possibly it's a problem of the product that was sold to our, the previous generation. Where, you know, now at least we, you know, it was, it was a product there, but now at least there's more education out there for, for our sort of generation, our children's generation. So as long as there's a good financial plan in place, you know, it, it should be okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll continue with this uh, discussion uh, talking about money management tools for couples across the African continent right after this ad break. <laughs> Welcome back to Personal Finance, where we've been tackling money management tools for couples across the African continent. We've heard about trends like the sandwich generation and also having a proper plan in place and maybe approaching your finances more like a team uh, from the sub-Saharan uh, African perspective. But uh, Nimi, if you can uh, paint a picture for us with regard to uh, the, uh, uh, the controls and the current landscape when it comes to couples trying to manage their money. Uh, the balance between couples having to look after their parents together with their children uh, how challenging is that on the Nigerian front? Oh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge challenge. And it's not just the sandwich generation where you're looking after children and elderly parents. We have an extended family, which is very, very large family. So you find often that you're, not looking, you're supporting cousins and aunts and uncles, apart from just the unitary family that you tend to have in South Africa and the West. So there's even a greater need for the, for the woman in particular to be very, very involved you tend to find that many, many women are quite reticent, taking a back seat and delegating almost all responsibility of the, of the family finances to their spouse or their, their husband or their, or their partner. And it's so important that they, that they become more involved, know where the documents are. I love the idea of the life, the life book where you can easily find things if anything goes wrong. Because we have you know, st terrible stories here of the spouse passing, passing on and, and the widow is just totally left in dire straits with the children because through our native laws and customs the, the extended family sometimes come into the picture and, and, the, and the wife, the widow is left with almost, almost nothing and the children's education is in jeopardy and so on. So it's so critical for teamwork to be in place, the woman to understand what's happening, where documents are, who owns what, 
put things in place, not just take a back seat, because that, that could come to dire consequences. Mm -hmm. Bruce, let's get your perspective on another sore spot for many couples, which has to be debt. And I take it the non-disclosure thereof can have uh, dire consequences uh, on uh, one's credit score and credit rating. And like we've said in the conversation before, it goes back to the type of uh, marriage contract or relationship uh, contract, if there is such a thing that you have in place. Well, absolutely, and it you know it goes back to the, again to the team approach that I, I keep saying to all my clients, is that if if the, if the spouse doesn't know what what debt there is and what life cover there is to cover that debt, um, and the one spouse dies, I mean it can leave them in, in a drastic situation. So, um, yeah, we we like and I like again I also like what uh, Michelle spoke about the life book. You know, if your spouse doesn't know what's going on in your life from a, from an asset or from a liability point of view. Um, I, I always question what sort of a marriage that they've got. Um, but we also always insist that at all our meetings, both spouses, if possible, are, are in that meeting to ensure that uh, something like this doesn't happen. Mm. Adam, you're nodding your head, so you clearly agree quite strongly. Uh, have you dealt with some bad situations where I've, debt I've crept out of nowhere? I've seen a lot of situations where uh, I've often, uh, ideally I want both husband and wife there. Uh, it's critical, the, the whole transparency thing. But I've seen situations where they particularly haven't wanted each other there, and mm. that also raises lots of concern because, you know, there's also the husband feels that, that he's got to look after his princess, and for that to happen, he's not going to tell her about all the behind the scenes debt that he's maybe taken Let's out. Let's say it honestly, Adam, just in case she calls <laughs> a couple of hitmen and then uh, exactly. things and go then, wrong. Exactly, and then it'll go pear shaped. So mm -hmm. ideally, it's it's important that the wife or uh, spouse needs to have some form of protocol to follow. And I think we need to place a lot more em emphasis. Michelle mentioned a will. Mm -hmm. A will is so critically important, especially when a couple gets married. They're buying assets together. It also depends how they were married. But a lot of financial planners won't emphasize that. And I think it's important to emphasize that a will is something, it's probably the most important document in a financial plan. Uh, in fact, it is. So yeah. to die in test state, with meaning you die without a will, it's diabolical. And I think as soon as that the spouse knows who to contact in the event of something going wrong, or God forbid she's been widowed, uh, it, it, as soon as she has that contact and she knows what processes to follow, it technically should go very smoothly. Mm -hmm. And it's quite an easy thing to overlook. That's true. Mm. Uh, Michelle, it seems as though your book of life is uh, something that's a key yeah. favorite here. <laughs> <I think> yeah? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Quite clearly. Uh, but uh, Adam obviously alludes to something which is so true that uh, nothing in life unfortunately lasts forever. Mm. And either couples are separated by death or by divorce. Uh, uh, divorce being the more stringent one, I think, because then that's not when you have the cooperation between the couples to mm. uh, split their finances amicably. Definitely, definitely. I think for me the most important thing is to just have those conversations. Mm. Mm to understand what it is that your partner feels about debt. So are they quite comfortable to have a credit card, for example, that kind of rolls from month to month? Or are they the type of people that don't want to have any debt whatsoever and believe the credit card needs to be paid off at the end of the month? There's nothing wrong with either approach as long as it works for you as a couple mm -hmm. and that you understand each other's ideas ab about debt, for example. The same thing about um, are you going to build a career uh, once perhaps you have children? Mm. How do you feel about those kinds of things? You know, if we haven't had those conversations and all of a sudden baby arrives and wife wants to stop working, yeah. that could come as a bit of a shock. Um, but if we've had those conversations and we understand exactly what our goals are for life, it, it means we can work together. Mm. Team approach obviously coming through mm. again, as Bruce alluded to there. Uh, but Bruce, also just to get uh, your feeling and maybe uh, in your experience, the kind of clients that you've come into contact with, uh, with the split that takes place, and as Michelle alluded to, the significant changes like children, uh, and even more importantly, what happens when a couple does split and there are children that need to be taken care of? I take it legal nitty gritties also creep in there when it comes to the maintenance of either spouses or their offspring. Yeah, I think, I in my experience, death, death and divorce are probably the two worst things that can happen to a couple um, because it always seems that on death, the, the, the people inheriting or hope to be inheriting come out the woodwork and in divorce, people turn on each other and it's, it's a horrible thing to see. So, um, you know, what, what Adam and Michelle spoke about earlier is, is to have the team approach, but certainly make sure that if something like divorce does happen, that, that it's sorted out before it does happen. Um, 
uh, yeah, right from the time that they get married. You know, couples go and they see marriage counselors and all sorts of things before they get married or go and see their, their reverend. But very few of them go and see financial planners when they, mm -hmm. you know, when they pl plan to get married. So, so I think if they can do that right from the start, get together with a certified financial planning professional right from the start, um, it should hopefully alleviate a lot of the problems that will happen through death, death and divorce. Mm. Nimi, if we get your voice, I think often uh, uh, financial advice is maybe perceived as a luxury at times for many consumers on the continent. But like we've been discussing the theme, death or divorce, uh, the outcomes aren't always favorable. But uh, in uh, uh, Lagos, are there yeah. particular patterns and, and uh, legislative in place uh, to uh, make it seamless and easier? If there's a will in place, that's why it's just so important that the estate plan is a, is a fundamental part of the plan. And here we're very, very, it's, you know, talking about death is like a taboo. So people don't, I know you're very advanced in writing wills and you can almost get a will off, off the shelf. Banks here that have tried to put that in place, customers are so nervous about being told to write a will. And I do quite a few speaking engagements. And when I do a survey and just check how many people in an audience of, say, 400 people have got a will, and literally nobody has a will. And they've been married for 10, 15 years. So we've got a long way to go in terms of getting the public to understand that you, you do need to protect your loved ones with an estate plan in place or, or you know, or the breakup of a marriage or, or death, mm -hmm. because otherwise the consequences are, are dire, particularly with the huge extended family system that we have here, where other, other members of the family can, can come into the picture and, and have pulls on the income or the assets of the family as well. Mm -hmm. Many, many people, many, many men here put their brother as next of kin instead of their, their spouse, which is more usual in the West. In South Africa, I suppose, it's, is it the spouse as well for the, for the next of kin? Yes, that yes. would be correct. It would be the way, yes. So here you find that people are putting their, their, their brother as, as next of kin bef ahead of their wife. So that mm -hmm. also has um, huge implications, which is why the wife must be involved in the finances as a team. They should work things out together so that there are no surprises if there's an accident. Time for us to recap on this conversation regarding money and couples. Uh, Nimi, let's start with you. Uh, your key considerations that you think uh, uh, couples need to be aware of when it comes to managing their finances together. I think the most important thing is coming from a position of trust. So I love the whole idea. We've Everyone's touched on that in terms of communication. I think there should be a regular time that people come together and discuss the situation. So you can't afford to be hiding away debt that the family doesn't know about. So it's so important to put a definite um, budget together and plan together for short, medium and long term goals. I believe that the assets, the way the assets are structured should be discussed and people should both know what, where the documentation all is. I think those are, those are very, very important. But communication is where you're going to be able to be open and bring everything to the table so that both, you know, it could be the spouse that's earning a lot more, who pays for what, who determines what, who is better at managing the family finances mm. so that it becomes a seamless team, team engagement. I think with the team, you have much better prospects of having financial success down the line. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Bruce, just to close off with you very quickly, uh, teamwork being mentioned there and uh, Nimi basically hitting the nail on the head, I take it, with uh, regard to uh, money management for couples. Oh, she nailed it. Um, I, I was hoping she wasn't going to say that because that's what I was going to say. But <laughs> You know, I think when you do the team approach, when you both understand both on the income side and on the budget side. So, you know, obviously there's going to be one spouse that's possibly earning more and you need to um, plan your finances accordingly. So I think that's very, very important for especially the new couples to understand what each of you are earning, one, after tax income, and two, what your current budget is. And then work around that, you know, work around that budget. And then start build and the second thing is to start building up those assets together. And how you structure them is, is obviously uh, personal. It's, uh, every, every situation will be different. Um, and then most importantly, or not as, as importantly, I think, is, is planning for death. Um, and yeah, that, that, uh, that little box that, that Michelle spoke about, is, I'm going to take that back to my clients. I think it's fantastic. Um, and the importance of the will. I think nobody can underestimate the importance of a will. We have so many clients that don't, don't have wills. Um, and the consequences of not mm. having a will is, is, is serious.
Mm. Michelle and Adam, I take it you agree on all the points there and uh, that book of life certainly going a long way with teamwork being uh, the key themes that have come out this evening. A big thank you to all of you for joining us this evening. I think uh, a lovely exchange of ideas when it comes to money management for couples. I'd like to thank all of my guests, Michelle Dubois, who's a legal marketing specialist at Liberty, Adam Halper, certified financial planner with Discovery, Bruce Fleming, he's a certified financial planner with Consolidated Financial Planning and is also affiliated with the Financial Planning Institute in South Africa. And in our Lagos studio is Nimi Akungube, who is the chief executive of Best Man Games. Well, that's where we leave it for personal finance this evening. Do be sure to get in touch with us. You can tweet us at CNBC Africa using the hashtag finance410 or to myself at Kukumfupi. Until next time, happy financial management. Goodbye, everyone.